and definitely a lot harder in this case. Make it about the Axis navies in World War II. So, the top five weaknesses of the navies, why they were and how to fix. In January 1940, on the 1st of January 1940, for the major Axis navies. Well, there's a problem here. The moment war begins, you're in a bit of trouble once it comes to fixing things, and because you have to deal with the immediate needs. The immediate needs of these nations are complex. Japan's not currently in the war at this point. In January 1940, they are 23 months away from war. In January 1940, though, the Germans are involved, are fighting hard. The Italians are watching from the sidelines and seeing what's going to happen. Germans have scored some victories. That's been rather cool for them. They have caused the British to lose ships, mostly thanks to their submarines. Which is something the British are not happy about. But the British did start off more with more to lose, but also ultimately more lessons to learn because quite a lot of stuff they'd learnt at the interwar exercises mm, had proved accurate, but also proved to be a little bit um, scenario led. It's the trouble with having peacetime exercises and learning from them. You can learn a lot, but you don't always learn the right lessons, and you don't always learn the importance of the lessons. So you might view a lesson as being, well, that's, uh, that's you know, conditional, when it turns out to be universal once you actually get into a war, and the rule you thought would be universal turns out to be highly conditional, probably subjective, and perhaps completely and utterly wrong, depending on your perspective. So it's easy. Again, we have the requirement. What are these weaknesses in January 1940, and how can they fix them? So Japan. Japan hasn't even formed the Kido Batai at this point. They are starting the 4th Naval Armament Supplement. They are building as rapidly as they can, and you can see this by the fact that in 1940, they match the US. In terms of shipbuilding. And in 1941, they exceed the US in terms of shipbuilding. And for those who want to know where that information comes from, I suggest the book Kagan is a very good read. However, and I say this with a lot of love in my heart, what are the Japanese building? One of the things, once you look at this sort of tonnage, is that looks a, a lot of a lot of tonnage, a lot of, a lot is being built. But you also realise, hang on, if you can surge up to one hundred eighty thousand tons, what have you been building? What has been taking up all your knee, is sucking all your life out of your shipbuilding prior to that? Well, they're massive. They're overwhelming. They're not Nagato here, which is pictured. They are Yamato and Mojashi. When you realise that Japan in 1941, when war is looking likely, can go up to 180,000 tonnes of construction. And yet, in the years previous to that, they're at 45, 40, 35 and 50. Because they have two rather large battleships soaking everything up you start to realise what they're dealing with. The US then even has some interesting times in 1940, because technically their tonnage goes down. Why? It's dealing with battleships, it's dealing with the various requests from the UK and other countries for fixing things. That has an impact on what they can build. So what do I do? Well, battleships are still useful, so I'm not going to change my mind on that. And 
Honestly, that would require a lot of foreknowledge to try and presume otherwise, but battleships are still useful throughout World War II. Yes, their role changes, but in 1940, they are still being considered very, very useful and very much up there. So I'm not going to stop that. But I do need to stop something. I need to stop sort of sitting on my hands when it comes to construction. The, jump, the fact that I'll jump to 180,000 tons order next year is too late. I need to jump to that this year in 1940. I need to jump to that straight away. I need to every ship which is designed to be potentially converted to a carrier, I need to convert to a carrier. Every ship which can be converted to a carrier, I need to convert to a carrier. And I need to build a escort. And its job has got to be AA guns and it and anti-submarine warfare. And speaking of that, I have probably got to call up the Swedes and go, Hi, I really like your 40mm. This is without foreknowledge. This is just looking at the guns that Japanese have at this point. I really like your 40mm. National pride means I should probably keep pers uh, pursuing what I've already got, but I am a grown enough adult that I can admit national pride is not going to solve this problem, so please, can I have the machinery and the necessary capabilities to build those 40 millimeters? Why have I picked the, uh, why have I picked the um, Bofors over the pom-pom? Simple. Britain's at war at this point and will probably not want to supply me with the capabilities to build it. Whereas the Swedes are very pragmatic and generous, and presume I will not be at war with them at any point, so will quite happily supply me with a lot of tools. Also, I'm no longer technically at war with the Soviet Union, so I can bring stuff overland through Russia. And I'm no longer, and they're not technically at war with Germany, they're technically allies. So that's actually quite a technically easy route to make it. Just have it put on a boat by the Swedes, taken to Russia, put on a train, taken across, gets to Vladivostok, put on another boat brought to me. There you go, I've got the machinery. Also, again, war's coming. What can I do in January 1940? Again, I emphasize the synthetic oil. Make some success synthetic oil plants. Make some oil, coal to oil plants. You have good quality coal, roughly. You can do this. What else do I need to do? Infrastructure internally. This is not really a Navy thing, but it is a Navy thing, because if I can get some railways built, and yes, railways do take time if I have to build them properly, but if I just build them out of concrete sleepers and design of the last of 10 years, if I think a war's coming soon, I can probably get some narrow gauge railways running around the country. And if I've got some railways running around the country, that means I don't have to do coast, uh, don't have to do as many coastal convoys. That's going to reduce the pressure on my escort fleet, which I don't have much of one. What else do I have to do? Build submarines. However many submarines I have, I can't have enough. I need to build more. I need to build a lot more. There is often, and I've done videos about this, an obsession with the Kantai Kesson, the decisive battle doctrine. But there are far more doctrines than that, as I've discussed in that video, that affect Japanese procurement. And the idea of building a 
basically conquering a defensive area and then attriting the Americans as they approach is a key strate a strategy, a key part of the pre Kantai Kessen strategy, i.e. before you have a decisive battle, first a trip to the enemy. Then I, I need submarines. And I can't have enough submarines. It's submarines and it's escorts which are in big weakness. I'd love to have more of a merchant marine, but there's only so much I can build. There's only so much industry. And honestly, if I judge it right, I can probably get a decent escort out of some of my small to medium sized yards, which I do have some of, rather than drawing from the major navy yards. Allowing the major navy yards to concentrate on the carrier conversions, on the submarine construction, and probably on trying to finish off another battleship, although I probably won't I won't finish it off. It'll probably be turned into a carrier at some point, but that'll be uh Next year's fun. Nineteen forty two is fun, more than likely. Ah, oh, Japan. So much opportunity. Now, Italy. In Italy in January nineteen forty is in an issue. It's got El Duce being a mm. they aren't yet in a war. But they could soon find themselves in one. And the fact is, Italian supply shipments to Tripoli, Benghazi, and Tobruk were all under strength. They didn't have enough supplies going across, even by June. And that's why in June, in an example of what was going to happen throughout the rest of the war, they send off far ships laden down with supplies that therefore can no longer rely on the speed which advantage which they had relied upon for their advantage and survivability. And um, they have an and they have an issue. In this case, they send three destroyers. Three of their newer, better, more capable destroyers. And they get bushwhacked by the uh, by Royal Navy cruisers. Now the Royal Navy cruisers do not shower themselves in glory in this point. And trust me, they fire a humongous number of shells. To sink one destroyer. And it is five light cruisers on one side. On the Tovi. And three destroyers on the other. More importantly for the Italians. They do lose Enrico Bassoni. Who was probably one of their better officers. Of the destroyers. And certainly one who was smart enough. To understand what the situation was and to turn it to advantage. And he got two destroyers through. Admittedly, he got his own one and himself on it sunk. But he did a very good job of someone in that situation. But the thing is, why is he in that situation? Well, he's in that situation because no one makes the changes. In January 1940, what could they have done? Well, you can't lay a pipeline that's going to move, as these three ships are moving, um, a black shirt, or technically, Militia Voluntaria per la Silesia Nationale, um, the anti-tank unit, to, to the brook. You could make, possibly, a pipeline across the Mediterranean to deliver fuel, but let's be honest on that front. As much as it would be lovely if they could, they did. Operation Pluto. That was put in by the Allies to supply fuel to Normandy across the beaches. Across the Channel. Was incredibly complicated. Took years of work and months of preparation before they laid it. Now, admittedly, that was under a war fighting scenario, and this is January 1940, so they could have potentially have laid it prior to war beginning. It also might have been sensible to, I don't know, increase the number of telephone cables and telegram cables going across the Mediterranean. 
But we'll leave that all to one side, all those things which could have made life a little bit more secure communications-wise. What can they really do in January 1940? They already are one of the densest concentrations of anti-aircraft firepower of any fleet in the world this time. So they can't really change that. There is not much in January 1940 they can do to change the stars. There really isn't. You'd want there to be. There deserves to be. That the Italian Navy is arguably a far more rounded, far better organisation than its German counterpart. And yet there's nothing much they can do. They could again start working on their quality control of their shells. That would be a big improvement. And they've got a few, couple of months. They could, you know, push that through. Otherwise, realistically, what the Italians need to be doing is stockpiling fuel and stockpiling ammunition which means they need to start buying a lot of it. As much as they can get from um, from Romania, as much as they can get from anywhere else, they need to start stockpiling. But that's a sensible decision to make. And the trouble is, the Italian government doesn't seem to be making sensible decisions. They are soon going to invade Greece and actually end up being kicked back by the Greek and uh, the Greeks. And it's going to be the Germans who are going to have to come in to save them. Mussolini, who a few years before this was possibly the most powerful man in Europe, or at least looked like it. Who Hitler felt he needed the permission of to go into Austria because if the Italians... If the Italians responded when he did when he invaded Austria, he would be forced to withdraw because of their perceived military superiority. Actually, it would have been quite an interesting contest. I'd have probably watched two forces which were equally bad at that point, flagrantly flagging around. But no, there just isn't much the Regia Marina can do to fix their problems. Kriegsmarine. Kriegsmarine. January 1940. They're riding high. They are riding so high. They sunk a battleship. They sunk an aircraft carrier. They've done a sojourn into the world. And, you know, they, they, they feel good. They've also lost one of their Deutschland class. But, overall, they can claim it did well. It tied up a huge amount of British and French assets. And its crew seemed to have acquitted themselves well in Montevideo. But realistically, what can they do? What can they do to change their stars? What are their weaknesses? Their weaknesses at this point are lack of destroyers, lack of anti-submarine warfare escorts and convoy escorts, lack of an aircraft carrier, lack of anything really they need to form a coherent task group to go out into the North Atlantic. They can do raiding operations, but the impact of a raiding operation of a single type of vessel versus a coherent task group is dramatically different. So what would I be tempted to do at this point? I can't fix my light cruisers. They are my big Achilles heel. If I could have decent capability in terms of light cruisers, I could get a lot more out of my operations. I can't really make my heavy cruisers more efficient. I can rename Deutschland because if she gets sunk, that will be problematic. Um, so she'll become Lutzau, as she did in real life. But honestly, there is a limit to what I can do. 
My major weakness, and something I can still perhaps do something about, is fuel. But there's a limitation again to what I can do for that. There's a phony war going on at the moment. And I'm in it. I need to ramp up torpedo production, e-boat, or as the Germans call them, Schnellboot. Because if I'm realistic, I do not have enough forces and I'm not going to get enough supports to engage the British in a conventional naval battle in the North Sea. I can't do that. So, I need long-range torpedo boats that can help me break out into the North Atlantic if I'm going to be able to do surface radar. And I need to pose surface radar threat for a very simple reason. Okay, I don't necessarily need to always do it, but I need to pose the threat. So the Allies always have to prepare to counter that threat, which ties down their forces. Because if I let any one of my threats, submarines, surface raiders, or anything, become a one-dimensional threat, so that all the enemy has to worry about is surface raiders, well, then you would suddenly see a large number of Vessels which were basically torpedo carriers. They'd be small ships loaded with a festoon with torpedoes. If all my attacks are from the air, they'll be small ships festooned with AA guns. If all my attacks are submarines, they'll just be carrying depth charges and nothing else. So ultimately, I need to try and keep up the multi dimension threat. And if I'm going to maintain that, I need to make the multi dimension threat look viable. I cannot rapidly build destroyers. I don't have the industry or infrastructure to be able to do that. So, what's the next thing down I can build? Torpedo boats. Now, I can theoretically build quite a lot of those. If I'm prepared to build them at a level at which they are expendable. Which is terrible to think about. Again, no one likes to expend crew and brave people. But, again, if I build them at a level at which I can put relatively junior officers and relatively barely trained crews in them, so that I can use swarms of them to get my larger surface of combatants to sea and out to the sea, that's useful. And that's really what I need to think about them with. Again, imagine Denmark Straits, but... There's a horde of torpedo boats there from the Germans. The British probably lose not just Hood, but Prince of Wales. And maybe some cruisers. But also the British would be forced to react to that. So the British would not be able to send a battleship of any kind, and not a battle cruiser or either, or any sort of thing out, without having a destroyer escort, which would put a strain on their destroyers. So, if I let my threat become singular focused, but yes, I've had great success with my submarines. But if I focus my threat, uh, my operations just on producing submarines, I actually make the British job easier. And I, my main advantage that I can give Germany and I can give my nation, if I am the commander of the German Navy at this point, is complicating the life of the British. It's making their job as complicated as possible. I don't actually have to deliver on any of these threats because I'm going to slow down the flow of trade, the flow of trade by making them form a convoys to begin with. So any threat form makes them form a convoys. Then if those convoys have to be protected against submarines, that's going to require one thing from their uh, their ships. If they have to be protected against air attacks, that's another thing. But remember, I am the navy, so I don't have control of the condors and the production of aircraft. They are under control of Luftwaffe, so that is not in my purview. I don't have a... If I can have an aircraft carrier, that's suddenly going to cause trouble and cause them to start thinking about air defence for their convoys from that perspective. But, again, that means I have to finish off my aircraft carrier. So my last area where I do have something is a surface threat. So if I can make the con them form convoys, which slows them down, and if I can make them have to worry about protecting those convoys 
from large major surface combatants, meaning every convoy probably needs some destroyers with torpedoes and escort, and they need to have battleships and heavy cruisers positioned around to be on call if there any if I, any convoy comes into contact with them. That's going to be a tie on their resources. If every convoy ha and uh, uh, remember, both these groups, uh, both the heavy ships and the convoys, need to be escorted to protect them from submarine attack. So everything I can do can t ties down British resources and makes their lives more complicated is a good thing. But my weakness at this point is not that I'm over-reliant on submarines. I don't have enough submarines. I need to ramp up production. I probably, therefore, and this is with some foresight, but also quite sense by the time, because the person in charge of production at this point is the guy in charge of the five-year plan, who is Hermann Goring. Goring. If there is any earthly way to get production of naval capabilities away from him, I should be doing that. There is no doubt in my mind that that is, without a doubt, the most sensible solution I can make at any point to accelerate production. Because I cannot do anything if I don't have the actual units to do it with. That's about it, really. But, on the aircraft carrier front, here is the Graf Zeppelin. Okay? This is a form I can tolerate looking at it. Because, let's be honest, once you get into the deck plan and the hangar plan and the various other ideas, you go into the most convoluted, complicated ship you can possibly imagine building for an aircraft carrier. Yes, it is the perfect solution. Yes, it provides you with the ultimately perfect solution. You are able to focus your aircraft on what they need to do perfectly. You are not going to have any aircraft damaged in a storm by their moving across. You're not going to have to worry about chocking them down and everything. You can organize everything in a perfect fashion. It's amazing. It's also absolutely terrible. It's overly complicated and it makes your ship overly complicated to build. Yes, it is a better solution than tying aircraft down, but not by enough to justify its cost. It's a thousand times more complicated than tying aircraft down for only a 10% margin of superiority, if that. Tie your ships down. Or as the song goes, tie the kangaroo down. The Graf Zeppelin is the ultimate example of what could have been. When you're talking about the Denmark Strait and the Battle of Denmark Strait and the scenario that comes up with Bismarck going out to sea, we often concentrate and talk about well, what would have happened if it had had Sean Horst and Eisenhower with it or if it had had you know, more capital ships. They are one thing. But imagine it has this with it. Imagine it has an aircraft carrier with it, and a cruiser, a couple of cruisers, as escorts, and to assist the carrier. So let's say you have this mighty force of four ships going out. Massive force. Well, suddenly, your torpedo bomber attacks, well, they've got to get through defending fighters. Okay, instead of being able to launch flight level attacks and not really worrying about any German response, you suddenly have to start launching squadron level attacks. You're talking full force attacks. You're having to get the air group up together. You're going to have to have fighter coverage. You're going to have to have everything in. The range of possible attacks on convoys is dramatically increased and the information available to the task group commander is massively increased because suddenly they have a lot more scouting capability even if you go back to the battle of the denmark straits does it even happen and you've also got the effect on the british the germans have an aircraft carrier what are the brits going to respond with 
Well, suddenly the ratio of capital ships is going to have to be matched by a ratio of carriers. And they still need carriers in the Mediterranean for doing operations there. And they need carriers for other operations around the world. The British will be having to panic build carriers like no tomorrow. Which is going to make a strain on their industry. It's probably going to affect their cruiser production. It's probably going to affect their destroyer production. It's probably going to affect everything else. So, you get this one vessel working. You get this one vessel working. You can cause more disruption, more pain, more trouble for Britain than any other combination. Doesn't even have to work that well. It just has to work. That's a scary thought, isn't it? If in January 1940, the commanders of the Kriegsmarine, if Raider, Donitz, and Karras, the deputy of Raider, had got together and gone, we will get this carrier in service. They would have immediately rectified several problems in their force. And they could have got it into service before Bismarck. They could have had it in service so it and Sharnos and Neisenau could have gone out and had fun. And that then is a different scenario. Because do you need cruisers if you've got both Sharnos and Neisenau with you? And we won't even get on to the nightmare fleet there would be if they somehow managed to get Bismarck. Neisenau, Scharnhorst, and the Graf Zeppelin all to guard in a task group together. That would have caused the Royal Navy to tr call in everything. It would have been battle group versus battle group, carrier fight in the Atlantic. And imagine the disruption to convoys that would have caused. Imagine the disruption to the movement of goods. Imagine the disruption in factories, the disruption of supplies, Food, everything. Not this is before you even get on to sinking something. This is the point I'm making. Before you get even on to sinking anything, the disruption this ship could have caused just by appearing in North Atlantic as part of a German task group would have been immense. Convoys would have been rerouted south. Maybe convo uh, convoys would be stopped sailing altogether. Some convoys would have to have their escorts as would have to abandon them to go and form up to back up the ta the British task force. All you have to do is get this ship ready. And they don't. Why? I there are lots of good reasons. There are lots of issues, but ultimately it's because it never commands enough attention and enough focus. Because ultimately, they never really think beyond, ooh, sexy big gun, or ooh, sleek looking submarine, which are both very good things. But the thing is, that's a rather two, -dim that's a two dimensional threat at most, and it becomes a very one dimensional threat. And the, you actually make the Battle Atlantic a lot easier for the Allies when you start to cut down your threat. Yes, the Type 21, etc., all these things would have been excellent boats when they get into get in, got into service. They would have been absolutely deadly. But they would have still only been a one-dimensional threat. It would have been submarines. We need to deal with the submarine threat. How would the Allies have dealt with that? Probably short-term increased a convoy escorts and the uh, escorts pinging away like mad all the time. Would it have been 100% perfect? No. Would it have been enough? Probably. Probably. Because by the time they get, they get into service, there are already a lot of supplies flying uh, throwing across and a lot of escorts in service. And you've also got to remember that the escorts coming into service are better than the ones that 
have already been in service. So there are more frigates coming in, and they're going to be a step change up. But again, you have made the threat one dimensional. Jumping out of the history, if we consider modern scenarios. We talk about hypersonic missiles a lot. But if you ever listen to bilge pumps or the various works on SimSec, you'll very quickly realize that hypersonic missiles are not the nightmare scenario. Hypersonic missiles combined with uh, subsonic standard missiles, modern, current, you know, regular missiles, and probably a submarine, a, a submarines attacking with torpedoes as well, all coming in at roughly the same time. That's the really scary scenario. Hypersonic? Have we got anything that reliably intercepts it? Mm, we're working on them. But we also know how to interfere with its targeting loop. But you send in everything. There is no way our systems can survive. And it's the same with convoys. And it's the same, you know, if they you are just attacking with one for, uh, with one dimension at a time, then you can focus and orient your forces. You can adapt. You can overcome that much easier. Two-dimensional threat. It's tough, but it's possible, and it's doable. Three-dimensional. That's a lot more problematic. You can still do it, but it's going to require a lot more forces from you. If we consider again, in World War II, the Germans don't have ever field a carrier. What does this mean? Well, it means that the Royal Navy gets to deploy a carrier to the Pacific, long before the British Pacific Fleet turns up. The whole saga of the USS Robin scenario. What does the USS Robin do? It backs up the US forces in the Pacific. But if Germany had had an aircraft carrier, there is no way Britain would have been able to deploy a carrier because they would have had to be concentrating on having those carriers for the home fleet, for dealing with any German movements to sea with their carriers and interfering in those convoys, those vital, life-saving, war-effort-preserving convoys. Biggest change that never was. And the British and the Germans could boast of, both have learnt by what happens with the loss of Courageous and how that affects the Royal Navy. So what have we got coming? Well, next week we have the Remond Montecarli class. Mm -hmm. That's going to be fun. Ren, and question for this, uh, this video. What's the question going to be? I think we're going to have an Italian focus question. So... You're the Rager Marina's commander in 1940. Taking out any option of killing Il Duce and having no foreknowledge, where do you look for providing escort numbers for any future war? Presuming that you are going to have to, you are going to be dragged in by Il Duce into a war. You are going to have to try and solve the problem of supplies going to North Africa, but also of your own fleet movements. You need escorts. How are you going to do it? And what do you think they should have done? Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. Ooh, that's only covered a bit.